Hey there boys and girls of the YouTube world. Today the Duff Dog and I are gonna load up this 1956 Chevrolet two-door post we just picked up from our buddy Eli at Rigid Customs. So we just got over to Rigid Customs. Uh, he's a good buddy of mine. He said, hey, I'm never gonna get to this 56 two-door project. You looked at it a couple years ago. Are you interested in it? I said, you know, tri-fives are all the rage. We did the 56 four-door post, so we might as well get another one. Oh, look, he's even coming to visit. Look, his, he glows in the dark even. What? You glow in the dark even. Absolutely. All right, I'm turning Duff loose. Let's take a look at this thing. I think he got it out of the Rapid City, South Dakota area. From, I don't know whether the original owners or not. A little rust in the eyebrow, pretty common. Down there in that trim piece, part of the bumper, whatever it is. I don't know a ton about Tri-Fives. Oh yeah, she's rotten by the foot hinges there. A little body work done there. Glass is busted. Yeah, he told me it had Bluetooth floorboards, I remember that, so. We're gonna have to do some patching and replace them there. You know, they might not be that bad. It's a 210 model, so it doesn't have all the trim that a Bel Air does, but it's got more than a 150. It is a two-door post. Looks like somebody put a different deck lid on it. Oh yeah, sure enough, 55 Chevy. But I think, oh, they're all the same. Try fives. Quarters look good. I think it was an all green car and then they started fixing her up. Don't worry, the six pack isn't for sale. Oh man, every one of those fenders gets ruined. This thing's pretty good though. What color is that? Metallic raisin chin? All right, let's look at this thing before we freeze to death. This quarter looks pretty good too. Ah, oh, she's got a little rot down here, so maybe you can put a partial quarter in it. A little rust in the rocker, a little rust in the dog leg. Fender's got a little hooey there, missing piece of trim. Bumper is tweaked, rust in this fender, just barely peeking out there. All right, we're getting the big boy equipment. Get this, uh... hey, is that the front end that I sold you? Where's the 56 hood latch, Duff? I think I got a battery. They had a battery in it! Somebody stole it. Oh, the old 235. Damn it, this is the second 235 I bought from you. No! It's got a chrome air cleaner on it. It's gotta be good. Dual reservoir master? You went all out. Mr. Meeseeks is our battery sponsor this week. I'm Mr. Meeseeks! Look at me! Automatic choke even? <laughs> Will it go? I bet if we had a shot of gas. Man, the snow's just blown in around her. Uh -huh. The snow's all blown in around the bell housing. Oh, it is, cho it is choking all the way, so. I was just gonna see if it's doing that. I can over it, but I remember right, I think the bottle shirt war. Oh, now all the, the issues with this thing are coming out. Got it out of gear? Game on. Game on! Game on! Game on! Game on! 
I should have brought the oh and it took it off the bead too. Dang it. Oh we got hubcaps. You had the wheels blasted and painted? Blasted and primed. Or primed, yeah, whatever. I wanted the beads to seal real good, so. You didn't want to be doing this. Oh, was the custom steering wheel in it too? You or did you put that in? Oh, nice. Yeah, the horn rings in the back, and there's one up front. Oh, Duff, Fivel is in here, and he is not in good condition. A couple of his friends as well. What a deal. All right, let's get this thing tied down. Fuel, it was the uh, oil pressure gauge also previously installed? What a deal. Look at all this extra stuff. Look at all those giant... Oh, we got extra pieces? The extra... Oh, no extra charge for the uh, trunk trunk latch? Right. What a deal. There's stuff in here. Whoa! Hi, <laughs> dog. Jeez! That's what happens when you see mice. Oh. What are you talking about extra stuff? The oil pressure gauge. You asked about the extra oil pressure gauge. Get out of there. Trunk ain't bad. Oh, so the price went down, right? Because with a flat tire and then it didn't start. Just give her a little snort, eh? New tires, he says. <laughs> New to me. All right, he's going to go get us the keys to give us a tour. So if you want to see uh, Tour Rigid Customs, Go check that out on the second channel. He got his front end set back on a pallet. The old 5.6 is all loaded up, ready to go. Duff's over there trying to find his uh, farm cat slash shop cat so we can harass him. But yeah, overall, like I said, I'd looked at it inside a couple of years ago. No surprises, typical 56 stuff. All right, let's take a tour and head home. Like I said, if you want to watch that tour, check it out. Second channel, more Mort Ski Repair. Oh yeah, get yourself some merch. Maybe we'll have these stocking caps next winter season because uh, I think we kind of missed the boat here. Hopefully it starts warming up. All right, we made it back to uh, Mort Ski World Headquarters with the old 56 here. Eli said this thing ran and drove this summer, this fall, when he moved it from outside of his building because he needed the space inside his Anyway, he moved it outside. He threw a battery in it, didn't fire at his place, which whatever, it wasn't gonna drive out of the hole that it was in anyway. So we need to get air in this back tire before we do anything. And then let's give this thing a tickle of the hot sauce and see if she lights off. Little 235 is gonna bust right off. Otherwise we might have to get the point seal and more just keep flick. Yeah. Hey Duff, just be that easy. We knocked this tire off the bead. This is why I always like putting tubes in because you put a tube in, and they uh, don't go flat on you. And you can see by how the valve stem cap is off, he's clearly been adding air to that a lot. I bet the other ones all have them on it. Sure enough, he says, oh yeah, they don't leak. We got hosed again. All right, go grab that nice aluminum floor jack, would you? Pal, buddy old pal -o friend. She wants to go. And if we fill up the bowl there, 
It'll run long enough to prime itself. Or maybe we got sold a car with no gas in it. That wouldn't surprise me either. <sighs> Oh man, she almost even idles. All right, let's get this thing unloaded. And get it up on the hoist and see what the bottom side looks like. Maybe take it for a test drive. Maybe test the brakes and see if we got any brakes. What are the odds we got brakes? Ah, it's pretty good. Looks like it's got a dual reservoir master, right Duff? He says, get this thing unloaded so we can go get the next heap of junk. Oh, we better put our air cleaner back on. You can add chrome air cleaners to the list of Craggers and side pipes and flexi hoses. Hey, no flexi hoses on this thing. That's a plus. Brakes? Oh, yeah. Don't open the garage door. So nice. All right, we gotta go pick up another car before it gets dark. So I drove that thing outside. It doesn't run great, but it runs okay, and maybe it's just cold blooded. So. Let's we'll take Duff in there to make sure he approves. There's a bunch of stuff on the passenger seat and he can't ride on the floor because there's a big hole in the floor. So we gotta clean her out and we got a storm coming tonight. So I don't know when we'll get it, but we'll uh, take that thing for a little drive, see what we got, and we'll get it on the hoist and see what everything looks like underneath and get a better look at the outside, the inside, and under the hood, all that stuff. But we got stuff we gotta do right now. So we'll be back in a bit and I'll try to remember where we were at. Well, it's a couple days later, it's really bright out. Can't keep my eyes open. So let's see if this 56 will start. It is 17 degrees Fahrenheit. I got the hoist open. Let's get this thing inside and get it on the hoist and see just how bad the bottom side is and the mechanicals and whatnot. What say you, Duff? You like this thing, don't you? He's already getting attached. You better make it so we can see. Because, of course, it's snowing again, like it does every day. Mojo hasn't seen this thing. He had a 56 back in the day. So, we'll see if he latches onto it right away when we bring him to the shop. What do you think, Duff? Is she gonna start? It's gonna need a seat, is what it's gonna need. The shifter's gonna need some lube. I think we're gonna have to prime it. Yep, definitely need some hot sauce. A <clears throat> little hot sauce, she's gonna be good to go. 22,779 miles. Come on, baby. Little hot sauce goes a long ways. Oil and generator lights aren't on, so either they don't work, or 
we got oil pressure and the alternator's charging. Snow nuts! Ooh. The uh, speedometer cable's not real happy. That's why she's dancing around there. Got the old 56 up on the hoist. Let's take a look at the bottom side here before we even take a look at the top side. Well, the splash pan for the radiator and all that's there. I can't see a lot of the suspension because it's packed with snow. Eli said he went through all the brakes. I don't know if that's just wheel cylinders and hoses or I see there's a master cylinder on it. Oh, it looks like he put hoses on it. So I'm guessing that's what he did was wheel cylinders and hoses. Who knows if he put and that good stuff in there. It's already been converted to an alternator. 235, three speed standard. Doesn't have all the overdrive goodness on there. Of course, got some holes, but the supports look pretty good. So maybe we can just get some piecemeal floors to put in there. Looks like we got a zip tie holding the Brake and fuel lines in place. That floor support's good. That floor is not. Inner rockers look good, but floors are rusty. Oh, there's a little rust in the inner rocker there. That floor support looks good. This floor support's a little uh, Swiss cheesy though. Frame looks real nice and solid. I'm guessing the output shaft seal's been leaking for a while and slinging oil all over the floors. Again, not the worst. This floor support's pretty bad, but this one's good, that one's good, that one's good. Inner rocker's pretty nice. Guessing those are factory shocks. Again, new brake line. This pinion seal looks like she was leaking as well. That's how deep it was in the snow. Right up there. Tires, round hole there. I don't even know if they're all 205 70s or not. Where's our exhaust end at? It is kind of loud. Oh, there it is. It does have a muffler on it, but needs a tailpipe. And the rest of the pipe doesn't look like, oh yeah, I'm sure there's no exhaust leak up there. I'm guessing that should probably be tight, but what do I know? Somebody must have had this motor in tranny out, because usually there's not orange paint on the transmission. So, I'm guessing somebody had the 235 and 3-speed out at one point. How's the trunk? Spare tire, usually the lowest spot, all the crap sits there because this drain hole is plugged up, but there might be a spare tire in there even. Ain't all rotted out. He did say he just pulled the drain plug, fuel tank cleaned up well enough. That's what it's running on now. Trunk floor looks good. A little rust in this back lip. And then, uh, is there a mount here? I don't know what that is, but it's a lot of rust is what that is. So, yeah, I'm guessing that brace is full of rot as well. So where do you start and where do you stop? Definitely needs the front floor pans. Rears, I'm guessing that's where they have the seat belt bolted. Could probably use that guy. This side's pretty good. So you could probably get away with just doing the front floors. We'll see. We'll do a little pricing, see what we can come up with. And then should probably do these body mounts back here. That doesn't look like much fun, but maybe you can just do this outer part. 
Or you could make them, I suppose. But usually this Tri-5 stuff is so reasonable, you can't even mess around with making stuff. So, yeah. Other than a little bit of rust that we kind of halfway expected, everything looks pretty good under here. But not too shabby. There's our fuel filler neck coming from the tail light. Some rust in the lower quarters and there's a pretty good crease going there. This rocker's pretty chewy. Dog leg's good on the fender on this side. This piece of trim kind of holds everything that comes off the tire up there and rots that and the fender extension off. The frame's been tweaked over a bit, so we can probably want to straighten that out before we get too crazy with the bumper. This side looks good yet, though. Oh no, just kinked right there. Everything got shoved over. Yuck. It's fixable though. This fender, same deal on the extension, and then it's got that little tweak there, and then that one's the one that's missing the trim, probably because of that tweak popped it off and it never went back on. A little rot in the dog leg. This, uh, what you call it, rocker panel is a lot better, but still a little rust there. This quarter ain't banged up, but it's got rust in that same spot. Looks like there's a support there. Dirt gets trapped behind it, rusts out. But should be able to fix that with just a flat piece of metal. Same deal with that rocker. Scab a piece in there. Looks like there is a little crease down here where they ran up against something. Nothing terrible. And then behind the wheel over here is pretty solid. So really, the exterior of the car is pretty dang good. I don't think you'd have to put full quarters on it. There's a little whammo there, right in the uh, body line. That's not a good spot for it to be, but I think that's fixable. Well, I think you're definitely gonna want a lower quarter here just to get all that out of there. Looks like it even goes up to the trim almost. All right, looks like we're going to be buying some sheet metal parts. Or not. Not! Who knows? Let's take a look at the rest of the car. Looks like we got a custom trunk latch here. We're going to need a lock cylinder and a latch, apparently. Sure enough, spare tires in there. How's it for rot there, duffel up, I guess? Ooh. Some surface rust, but I think she's pretty solid. Got the original 15 inch spare in body color. Yeah, get in there, check her on out, Duff. Bumper jack even, what a deal. There's that rust in that rear valance or splash pan or whatever you wanna call it that we were looking at. Apparently the uh, license plate lights are in the bumper on a 56. I did not know that. And apparently somebody swapped this trunk lid out. They're pretty notorious for rusting out in the bottom lip here, I think. But this one looks really good. Apparently, oh no, I thought somebody blasted it, but paint's just all baked off. But hop on out of there, pal. Come on now. No rides in the trunk. Oh yeah, there's that lip where everything sits in the back rots these things out. Alrighty. Oh, the latch is there. Just uh, doesn't do latch things, apparently. That's unfortunate. Better get that latched again. Got it. Looks like somebody had a stereo in it. It's got the carpet and the rear speaker deck and some really nasty square looking speaker things. Door panels are pretty ragged. Needs a few pieces of glass. I think this one's broke. And then that one, no, that's just water. But a lot of it's delaminating down at the bottom or edges of the glass. Dome light even works. What a deal. Headliners, kind of there. It's not all mossed out. Both the seats are there. 
What's that? Battered and breaded cubed beef steak for chicken frying. What a deal. Looks like we got some trim pieces there. Ooh, a feeler gauge set. What a deal. A steering wheel horn ring. There's the steering wheel because they put this sweet three bar one on, which I don't hate actually. Looks like they took the rad meal out of there. Looks like there's some scotch clips under the dash, some big ugly yellow butt connectors. Oh yeah, put an add on oil pressure gauge. I guess I should have looked at that when we we're driving it in. I've never seen an oil pressure gauge with a tattle tail. That's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. Yeah, this has been an interesting car, this green with the black interior. Hmm. I think that seat's pretty savable too. And two door tri five seats, I'm guessing, are like gold. Fival is no longer with us, nor is his friend over there. I was thinking there was one up here too. She'd been moushed out a time or two. Doors latch flawlessly. I wonder if somebody shot it there or what? Yeah, looks like that's BB guns. God dang, kids. Shoot your eye out, right, Duff? You'll shoot your eye out, kid. Looks like that chrome trim is broke, but I do have another one laying around, but that one's cracked too. The uh, emblem up here is pretty sad shape, but that's pretty common, I think. Originally, this would have been a single reservoir fruit jar master. Eli converted that to a dual reservoir, so that's done for us. He did say the carburetor needs a kit, which we're aware of. Like I said before, somebody converted it from a generator to an alternator. Judging by the wiring. Oh, they just use a adapter connector. I was gonna say the wiring looks terrible, but I think they did it all right. 235, this should be a full pressure 235, not a uh, dipper style or Babbitt or whatever you wanna call it. It's got the uh, 848 head. That's one of the good ones. Uh, six cylinder cars, the radiator is ahead of the core support. V8 cars, it's behind it because obviously a six cylinder is longer. I think we need a battery hold down over there. Does it have electric or vacuum wipers? Oh, vacuum. The vacuum hose is the dead giveaway. I think you could get them either way. Of course, everybody converts them to electric when they upgrade these things. Got our ballast resistor on the firewall. Looks like somebody painted blue at one time. Good thing they didn't do a very good job. It's kind of all flaking off. Somebody painted the firewall black at one time. Yeah, not a whole lot to see under here. Just a Good old 235. He said he put points and plug wires and cap and rotor and all that good stuff. Looks like he put a fuel pump on it. You got an inline filter in there. Oh yeah, somebody's had this thing out painted all up. You see they sprayed over the starter. I think the starters were originally black. Yeah, it's a real good start. You see they capped off that line. The brake lines would come from the driver's side over to this T and then that would go to this wheel and then it would go back to the rear wheels there. And yep, he uh, unhooked that, teed into it, ran that over from the master cylinder. So yeah, good stuff. That yellow wire looks like she's been added on and it does not go through the ballast resistor. Interesting, let's just go right to the ignition, who knows. The uh, battery cables aren't in the worst shape and they're the correct colors. Oh, did they have a a rope battery hold down or was that where the uh, it must have been just where they they hooked into the tarp strap hooked around there and went over the top side piece of rope on the other side oh yeah sure enough classic you can get all that stuff dirt cheap i'm sure looks like they put it the wrong antenna on there i'm guessing that mirror goes here that's in the car yeah that antenna has got to go a it's way too long b it's not for this car there's that Oh, that glass is cracked. That one's cracked. You can see how it just all delaminates. You know, if you're gonna do one of these cars upright, you would obviously get all new glass. Delaminated pretty good, but it ain't all cracked up the windshield anyway, so that's a plus. So I really don't know what we're gonna do with this thing. Uh, obviously wheels and tires and stands. We should do something there. I'm not totally opposed to these stock wheels, but I wanna get a little bit more tire and maybe paint them body color or black. I don't know about the great primer. Even the 235, I don't hate. I wish it had a three-speed overdrive, but maybe we'll uh, patch up the exhaust, the old 235, stick a carb kit in it. Maybe uh, get that front end frame tweaked over. 
Get her bumper tweaked out. Tweaking out. Maybe we gotta patch the floors. Definitely gotta patch the floors. I'm on the fence as to whether we get an entire floor or we get just a piecemeal it together. It's a lot cheaper when you do that. And then again, it's a lot, it's almost more work when you put in four different floor pans as opposed to just getting one big one and doing it all in. The advantage of getting the one big floor pan is it gets all those braces that comes with it where we need to put two braces in there anyway, which I think there's six with that floor. I don't know, I'm not sure. I got like the V8, the 350, and the Turbo 400 out of that motorhome. We could slide right in. We got to do exhaust anyway, but then you're doing radiator hoses, then you're doing engine mounts, you're doing drive shaft, you're doing some different additional wiring. I don't know where you quit. And this thing runs and drives the way it is. So I think we'll just kind of patch it together and leave it. But I'll probably change my mind by the next sentence. So I'm gonna have a sandwich. We're gonna sit back, take a gander at this thing. And see what we do, Duff. I think it needs some torque thrust. What do you think? Yeah? Of course, I had a carb kit for a 61 Chevy car 235. It's a 121A by high grade. And that is the same kit that a 56 Chevrolet 210 calls for. So we'll pull that off and we're going to throw her in the carb dipper hypersonic ultra amazingness machine. Clean her all up. Hopefully that makes this thing run all the more gooder. Doing a little playing around with this thing last night. We had 205.70s all the way around. I went to the tried and true 235.75 pickup tire. Put that on the back and it looks way more gooder. I think those are a 2.6 inch tall tire. I think it's 28.8 and those 205s are 26.2. But now she's come down. And the only thing I got for lowering blocks on hand is these guys, which are two and three quarter but we can take and cut them off. I think it needs to come down like two inches, but we can cut these down. And then I think all I have to do is re-drill that hole for the alignment stud on the spring perches. Or, oh, these even got a taper to them. Interesting. Keep your pinion angle right. Or we could take some two by three tubing or whatever tubing we need, and we could make some new ones and you just you know, drill a hole for the alignment dowel on the bottom and then Put a bolt in there or whatever you need for an alignment dowel on the top so the biggest thing is u-bolts and we got a set of u-bolts there i always like keeping a set of lowering blocks on hand because wheels and tires make or break your ride so 235s i think are gonna be good and then we're probably gonna cut two coils in the front we're gonna get this thing down it seems like two coils is always the magic number one just isn't enough so yeah good stuff we were having sandwiches last night duff and i were pondering and Tiffany, she was over here. It's like, you know, need some more tire on the back of that thing. Get her squatted down. So, I think that's what we're doing. 
Mojo, our resident carberry builder, took this thing and put her in the old ultrasonic cleaner. She came out real nice. Somebody's been in here before, like this screw was not the right screw. And you can see they put a screw in the uh, bottom of the carb here to plug a hole. There should be a plug that goes in there. Somebody's had it apart and took the plugs out. They put a screw in there and had to grind it off for clearance. And then there's a there's a screw in here too because I think there's a, a through hole to put the shaft in there for something. They had a big, long, ugly screw in there. So at least we just cut the head off of that one. But, and then uh, the accelerator pump was kind of screwy. So we had to take another one apart and get a donor. But old Mojo, he made her happen. So let's throw this thing on there and see how she works. We know it did not have an accelerator pump before, so it should be way better. Right, Duff? Yeah. The beauty of these things is there's a vacuum line, a fuel line, two three-eighths fine thread bolts, a throttle linkage that you can literally hook up by hand, and that's about it. They're about as easy to swap of carburetor as you'll ever find. Chester Wonder. I'll just prime up the bowl here a bit. A little less work on our fuel pump that way. And our starter and our battery and everything else. She should pop right off and then we'll probably have to do a little adjusting on the idle. Maybe even the automatic choke setup. That should be enough to get her going. Oh man, she's leaking by the throttle shaft. Dang it. Looks like our choke isn't opening up, so let's open that up a little bit and then turn our idle up a hair. So what we're going to do here is loosen these three screws and we can either lean or richen up the choke setting here. There's just a spring on the back side, so you're just putting more or less tension on it. As the car warms up, that spring releases and takes tension off. Yeah, if we can get her to turn. There we go. We want it barely closing at room temperatures the way that I've always done it. But clearly I'm doing it wrong. But it sounds like it's definitely getting too much fuel, so hopefully that'll open her up. She'll run a little better. Choke's opening. Now let's turn the idle up a hair. I can't remember if there's an idle air mixture screw on these or not. I thought there was. Oh yeah, right over there. Mr. Nisik's dead on us or we got a bad connection? I guess somebody left the key on, so. We're gonna charge Mr. Meeseeks up under replacement. We got Hot Wheels coming in clutch today as the battery sponsor. We really should tighten those connections. What fun would that be? 
Now let's get her dialed in. She runs good enough to put the air cleaner on her. As it dies. infinitely better than it did before. Oh, don't forget your Cyclops under the hood. That's always a bad day. This one's had a rough life. This is numero uno. This thing made it all the way down to Kentucky on a 64 Chevy and that nice gentleman sent it back to us. All right, I think she runs good enough to close the hood. I take her for a test drive around the block, but we're in a pretty nasty storm right now. Not the worst one, but. You could see a mile. Oh, you could see my McLovin flag. I am McLovin. Standing straight. It's pretty windy and it's been snowing today, so there's some, some driftage going on. We'll get that golf cart out of the way. Get this off the hoist and bring something else in for now, but it runs way better already, I can tell. And looks better with those wheels. Well, I have a couple sandwiches with old Tiffany. See what we do next on this thing. Yeah, yeah. Got some ideas though. 14 percent. get back to this thing so we're gonna clean out the trunk vacuum it out a bit a eh, duff so let me know what we got there same thing with the inside we're gonna take all the parts out of it put them in our handy 27 gallon totes from Maynard's and then we're probably gonna pull that seat out and stuff so we can clean up the floor pans and then we know just how much patching we got to do right duff you want to get to cleaning for me you ain't even been in there yet because there's so much crap let's get that crap out of there
Well, we may have had one shop vac casualty. I was just thinking how great of a shop vac that thing was. So of course, it had to crap out on us. Floors look really good back here. There's uh, one little, oh yeah, that spot. There's a rust hole. Otherwise, just some surface rust. But you can see back in this tray back here, she's pretty chewy Chewbacca. And you can tell by the way that it is. This is an aspen. You can tell that it's an aspen tree because of the way it is. That's where it's gonna rot out because that is the lowest point and it's really hard to clean in there. That's at the back of the car so you know all the uh, acceleration, the old whiplash and 235 blue flame spits out. All that dirt and everything's gonna go back there. Unfortunately, I think there's body mounts in there too, so. Awesome. We'll just uh, pretend like we didn't see that. But yeah, maybe uh, throw a coat of primer on that or some pour 15 some rubberized bed coating and maybe not that extreme because we might have to cut it out later to fix that to rust but or just put a floor mat back in it we'll probably seal that stuff up though. oh man this is why i don't have anything nice because it would take me an entire winter to fix all that rust clearly or not we're getting any trunk latching from this situation so let's see if we can address that scenario so we don't have to use the old bungee cord anymore i mean although it is convenient because you don't need a key it's, it's a little tacky good thing the license plate conceals most of it and it's kind of matches the deck lid color but we don't want it waving at people when we're going down the road good idea yeah let's see what we can figure out there Well, latch seems to be working now. Latches. Turn the key to the right. Unlatches. Oh, sometimes it doesn't go. What do we got going on there? It's just got to be turns. Oh, you got to turn that up. But that was our problem the whole time. This just needed to be turned. Well, isn't that silly? That'll be handy if it works. Silly, give her a little coil while you got her out. The moment of truth. Is it going to latch Duff? You should probably get a new uh, trunk seal too. I'm sure that's not helping the uh, trunk not rot out anymore. Letting a bunch of water in there. Oh, cleaning out old cars. Make sure you got a lot of trash cans around. Here goes nothing. Woohoo! Woohoo! We got a trunk latch and a free bungee cord. Well, not free, but free to use for other things. But does it open with the special key? Sure enough. What a deal. You just tend to have a screwdriver to turn to the right direction so it'd latch. We'll see what kind of goodies you can find inside. Tail light, tire iron. Another tire iron, factory steering wheel. Back seat base. Complete with mouse house. The old battered and breasted cubed beefsteak for chicken frying. Better save that trim. That's about it, Duff. We just gotta take the seat out, clean up the mess. We'll probably get that back seat going on. I think we gotta pull an arm just to get that seat back out. See how she looks under that cover. Ew. 
So I want some of it. Pretty baked duffel up, I guess. Good news is it's there though. Right here. Ellsworth Federal Credit Union. I suppose we're gonna have to cut this seat out. Yeah, I don't have much faith either. It's rusty as everything's been. You wanna grab the Cyclops light so I can see what I'm doing? It kinda stinks in here. Yeah, that's why you like it. Oh dang it, somebody already got them. Look at this. The jumbo fuzzy dice hangs anywhere. Car, van. <laughs> Or home, perfect novelty. Penguin products, $3.99. Made in Taiwan, dang it. Another great Penguin product. Part number 2104, there's probably some NOS ones on eBay for like $80. Hey Mojo, did you have fuzzy dice hanging in the window of your 56? He's ignoring me. Son of a biscuit, we didn't break a single bolt off and they all pretty much came right out. Fine thread 516 bolts. It's always a good day when they come on rusty floor pads. Cause uh, cutting heads off of bolts around a flammable seat's real fun. Let's not start any more cabs on the fire. Oh, free catalog, Revel. Oh, somebody had a model kit car. Anybody remember? Oh, I'm pretty sure I had that 67 Malibu. I had a 56 Ford pickup, but not that one. It never was another Camaro's. Oh, Pro Street Beretta. Oh, what a time to be alive. And the Pontiac Banshee. Too bad that car never came to fruition, huh? Oh, son of a biscuit. Look at that mixtape. 10, 31, and 91, somebody made her on uh, Halloween day. The dining room, Schubert. The dining room, Bach. Uh, I know who Bach is. I know somebody named Schubert, but I didn't know they were a musician. We might have to jam to this thing. Oh, you kids. I don't know what this is, but these are pieces of amazingness. You stick your number two pencil in there and you wind them up. Good times. You'd see them laying on the street all unraveled. Oh yeah, the old cassette days. Not much else in here. What is this? The Maxim 49-EA. Voice activated earphone microphone transceiver. Wow, it even has a schematic. Printed in Korea. Huh, must have been a cop. Just kidding, no idea what that's for. Don't look like there's anything else in here. Probably take those seat belts out of there because uh, I'm guessing this fabric is probably not good after 60 years. They got some pretty cool latches on them though. I wonder if they got a name for who patented these hot rods. Patent pending. The Greenfield Company, Elk Grove Village, Illinois. Model number 707. I'd take some new old stock sons of guns like these and put in. Be sweet. Just kidding, we're actually gonna save these. I'm sure I will. Let's get those out of here and get that floor cleaned up and see just how deep we gotta go, Dove. Balls deep, he says. That's how we always go. Okay, let's do it. But those aren't gonna come out nearly as nice as the seat belt. Oh, look at that one over there. She's held in by hopes and dreams. Ooh, is that a dime? Sweet. What year? 72? Oh, 1990. Nothing else. Oh, more five on friends. He's a cute little guy. I was hoping I'd get away without having to do the rear floor pans, but that might be a negatory. Let's get them cleaned up. So many Fievel families. We had this thing cleaned out. And this guy is going to be of no assistance.
much left to smell in here, though. And there's probably a lot of smells, but not a lot of materials to absorb it. Let's get all the uh, mouse absorbent material out of here. You know, you could help. I bet you could tear this up with your teeth. No? Okay, then. Yeah, really, most of the rod is in the front floor pans. The back over on the passenger side is real solid. Driver's side's pretty good too. Other than that one spot where the seat belt was and then right here, there's a sill plate and then below that's like another sill plate is what I call it. Conceals the wiring and then where the floors meet the rockers. I'm gonna take those out because they're pretty Swiss cheesy. And uh, there's a front and a rear. The rear one actually came right out on this side. I wanna get them cleaned out real good and i think if we had a small break we could make one it's just a couple of bends like that easy peasy lemon squeezy and it gets hidden underneath the floor we can see this one's rotted into two pieces and there's just a bunch of dirt under there and so i want to get that out of there and get everything cleaned up so we know what we're dealing with at this point i think we can do just front floor pans and then maybe patch in that over there because it's pretty flat in that area and we got this side for a pattern but other than that yeah everything's pretty good but there again we should probably cut these out and see what the uh braces and everything look like underneath before we get uh, too crazy because i definitely don't want 700 dollars worth of floor pans that aren't gonna fix what i need and then end up buying a 1500 dollars full floor later yo so speaking of floor pans I'm gonna turn this ultrasonic cleaner off so you guys don't have to listen to that buzz because it's kind of annoying. There's a lot of floor pan options. So you got a full floor, front to back. And I think they only make that with the braces installed on it, but they might make it with just the floor, no braces, you put your own braces on. Then you can buy the braces all separately. And then you can buy like half braces or like sections of braces instead of the brace that goes left to right. And then they make a floor half, a right half and a left half. And then they make the front toe board of the floor. They make the main front floor. They make a left and a right floor. They make back quarters of the floor. I mean, there's every which way you can possibly imagine for them to make floor patches for this, you can buy them. Obviously, the ideal way is to put a whole floor underneath it, but then you gotta put it on the hoist or sneak it in there DD Speed Shop style and jack the front end up, and whatever. Or I think we're just gonna hopefully do the two front floors, left and a right, and then for that back part, we'll probably just make something. That's what I'm thinking right now. But might change my mind. And uh, guess what I'm getting at is some of those floors range from, like there's some really cheesy, they don't even look like they would even fit in there, like somebody pounded them over a stump like I would make for like 60 bucks a corner for the fronts. And then you can buy the transmission tunnel too. But then I think, I think at last I was looking, it was like 400 bucks, you can get a left and a right front floor and they look pretty good, pretty good stamping. So you gotta watch out. I've dealt with some, I did quarters on a 1965 uh, Falcon convertible for a guy and he bought these lower quarters on eBay and it looked like somebody hashed them out in their garage. They were terrible, they fit terrible, making them fit was not good. So buy the best, and those were the only quarters you could get for that 65 Falcon convertible, unfortunately, but make sure, spend a little extra money. I know it's floors, nobody ever sees it, but if you spend 300 bucks versus 150 bucks, you're gonna get a lot better quality part. All right, oh, Mojo brought in pictures of his 56 that he had back in the day. Let's see if he uh, left him here, we can take a look at him. So there's Mojo's 56, May of 72, that's him there. Strapping young fellow, doing a little body work, looks like he's taking the trim off. He said uh, when he got it, it was, you know, a dark green front fender and a light green door and blue quarters and it had a Bel Air title, but it didn't have Bel Air trim. And, he put, uh, it had those steelies on it, stock steelies, I presume, and it wasn't running and driving. He put the chrome reverse on the front, and slots on the rear, and then he ended up, ended up having chrome reverses all the way around, but he painted it. He calls it candy apple green, never heard of it, but had some traction bars on there. But anyway, yeah, him and some buddies, they stripped it down on one of the buddies' farms and taped the window off, and then they brought it to some other boys that did uh, auto body and WAP. And they painted it all that green, and they, they smoothed the hood, took the grill, 
or the hood emblems off of there and took the front bumper off. And then he said he had a balanced 283 because at the time he was working on an engine machine shop. So he did all that himself. And then he had the three speed overdrive. And he said that thing just took a licking and kept on ticking. And then he uh, put a, had a big Holly on. He said he had a 750 Holly, which I think is too much carb. And they put a Muncie four speed in it. That was giving him problems. So he had it in the trunk and somebody broke into the trunk and stole his Galdang Muncie M22 rock crusher. And then here's his uh, 72 Chevy four wheel drive half ton that he had, which is actually ironically still around town. It is painted red now and has rally wheels, but still a pretty clean old pickup. That was his shop truck back in the day when he had his own shop. And before that he had this, oh, I think it was a 51 or 52 Ford with the, uh, got it from Lake Road Standard Service in Hankinson, North Dakota. And this uh, 64 to 66 is what he traded off for his 72. And that was a homemade skid steer that somebody in Fairmont, North Dakota built. And he borrowed to take this building down brick by brick so he could reuse the bricks. And I said, you never use those bricks, did you? He says, no, what a waste of time. <laughs> Took that down for the bank, thinking he was gonna reuse the bricks. And there was a sprayer that him and his brother built back in the day, quite the contraption. So. Maybe we'll use uh, Mojo's 56 here as a uh, template. Pretty cool car, I would definitely drive that thing. He said it was still column shift and then until he put the uh, Muncie in it, then it was a floor shift. And then back to column shift. But yeah, 1972, that was a, what, 16 year old car? I'm sure they had some pretty nice parts. Unfortunately, he uh, wrecked it. And uh, the engine lived on and some other rigs over the years, but the car is no longer in existence, it sounds like. Too bad. The good old days. He wouldn't tell us what he paid, but I bet he probably gave a case of beer for it. What do you think, Mojo's 56, pretty cool? I concur. Paint me like one of your French girls. I want you to draw me like one of your French girls. Well, the shop vac's still kicking, the old six gallon, three horsepower, but who knows a good shop vac that we should get, or if somebody wants to be a shop vac sponsor, I don't have good luck with these things. They either suck and not in a good way, or they they go bad after six months. But anyway, let's take a look at this floors or lack thereof. So here's the pinch weld where the floor meets the rocker, and you can see right about there, that pinch weld stops. So the top of the rocker needs to be replaced for about 18 inches there. And then there's a floor support right there. She's rusty into that and into there. She's pretty soft back in here as well, because obviously that's the lowest point, and that's where all that crap sit under that sill plate. And then there's a pinch weld right here it runs all the way along into the tow board and that's another piece so we need the tow boards the bottom couple inches up there so yeah things are really snowballing let's look at the other side oh my gosh look at all those scotch clips under there and all those white wires ew, ew. on a positive note this side the rear floor is better there's a couple of pinholes back there nothing too crazy but the top of this rocker, well, the pinch weld is better, but the top of the rocker is just toasty, toasty. The good news is you could probably seam it, even if you seamed it down here. Most of it's going to be hidden underneath the sill plate, and then it's also, nobody's ever going to see it when the door's closed. So. And you could probably just bend something up there. I don't know. So, and this tow board... Is better, but still, like I said, there's the pinch weld. She's a little bit rotten in there. That'll be easy piece to replace, but it's pretty thin right there and there and there and there. And I don't know if the windshield leaked. It's it's soft all the way up in there. So where do you quit? Gosh dang thing. I think 
we're just going to get these two pieces and then scab in the toe boards and scab in that piece back there and call it good the next guy somebody who really loves tri fives can put an entire floor in it and do rockers and do all that but not us We got some Evil Bay floor pans. I think they were like 63 bucks a piece or something like that. Chevy Industrial, made in Taiwan. Fit looks pretty good, and it's gonna fix most of our rust. There's still some up there in the tow boards, and there's still some, you know, in that inner rocker area, and then behind the seat here, but this is gonna cover most of it. There's a ton of ways to put floor pans in. You can cut it out, butt it to where it needs to be, and if you've got a really good floor pan that matches everything up, it's not so bad, but you don't want to leave any gaps because then you got to fix the gaps. You could literally just take some self-tappers, screw this in, and uh, seam seal it, call it good. Just all depends on what you want for what you're going to get in the end. Since this car pretty much just needs a whole floor anyway, I think we're just going to you know, do like an 80% job. We're going to cut out as much as we can we're going to overlap it just a little bit so it's easier to weld but we're not going to use any sheet metal screws we're not going to use any uh, fiberglass none of that stuff but we're going to cut out as much as we can uh, i think there's yeah there's definitely floor support there so we're gonna go a little bit extra and maybe uh put some paint and primer in there but there's a pinch weld right here where this meets up and then there's a pinch weld up front where that leading edge meets up so we're gonna try to clean those up as good as we can. That's gonna be really hard to weld, especially as rusty as that is, and then being on the bottom side, but yeah. It's gonna make this car be a whole lot better because I just took her to boom tubes, got her back, we did some exhaust on it. It's kind of scary looking down, seeing the trailer and the road and everything else, so. Floors have been done a million times. I don't know what else to tell you. It's, it's trial and error, it's pretty simple. Nobody ever sees them, so you can do whatever you want. I don't like the old sheet metal screw method because then you crawl underneath the car and it looks like a bunch of porcupines are mating underneath the car. So I would say don't use rivets, don't use sheet metal screws, weld them in. Uh, definitely use seam sealer so you're not getting any moisture in there causing the new floor pans to rot out. And if you can get away without using the entire floor pan, do it because then if you screw up, you can buy another floor pan and it'll cover the hole. Or if you cut it out too big, screwed so that's all there is to it i'm just gonna do this real fast get it done because i hate doing sheet metal repairs and rust repairs so we're just gonna knock it out make it out so cue the music i'm gonna get my cutting disc out and my flap disc and my safety glasses and my earplugs and we're just gonna jam and then we're gonna get the welder and we're gonna get some paint and we're gonna have floors just like that Easy peasy lemon squeeze. Might want to get these wires out of the way first so we don't uh, screw those all up. We should probably take this old body mount bolt out. Because uh, once we put that new floor in, there's no longer going to be access to that. Yeah. I guess first things first, I'm going to kind of trace it out, and I'm not going to cut anywhere close to where my line is at. That way we give uh, get plenty of room, but we kind of got a feel for what we've got for uh, the plate. You know what I mean. Measure twice, cut once. That thing.
you can't guess what that is. Yeah, it's a park brake cable. Oh man. This is a stick car, so we should probably keep it. Button. Just regular cable, we can replace it if we need to. That's a Tri-5, I'm sure they make new stuff. So we're starting to get our floor fitted in there. I drilled some holes so that I can weld it to the inner rocker. I'm not gonna weld it on this pinch weld up here just in case we do decide to put a rocker on it then we don't have to cut those back out of there. I drilled some holes here so that we can weld it to that body mount. I do have a jack underneath the car putting some pressure up so that that body mount's kind of laying where it needs to be. We put some primer in there so that that stuff's all got a better chance of living. And now we're gonna run some uh, sheet metal screws in here just to hold it down. And then I think we're gonna try old uh, Fitzy Fabrications cutting butt where basically you uh, take a cut off wheel and you cut it at an angle, cut a little bit, weld it, cut a little bit more, weld it. And so we're gonna just have the uh, self tappers in there temporarily and then we'll take them out later. And of course I cut too far up over there. You can see how far off my mark is from uh, where the pan actually is, it went down quite a ways, so we're gonna have to patch that, not a big deal. And then also I cut this lip off of this tow board because it's in such bad shape and this tow board was in such bad shape, so we're gonna have to make a new piece for that tow board and then we'll just butt that up to here. No point in fighting with that rusty stuff, welding it to it just to cut it out later, so cut that out all out of there. Looks like it lines up pretty good, so yeah, pretty excited about that. Not so much the rest of it, but this is going all right. We'll be welding it in no time. All right, Duff? Oh yeah, just hanging out on his bed over there, relaxing by his dogfish. You got her made, pal. All right, I guess we are ready to fire up the welder. We're gonna use our Miller 140. It's a 110 volt, 140 amp. It's blue. I think we got some 023 wire in it because that's what we usually leave in that thing as of recent. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Let's do this. gotta burn our spot welds in over here and over here pull our screws out finish welding all this in and then clean it up and seam seal it so pretty much just everything's left yep getting close but it's in there it's in the hole it looks like I'm a wreck it's in the hole it's in the hole Save your old screws too. You can reuse these. They're expensive. We don't want to lose the shop.
There you have it folks, one floor pan installed. Took me about two-ish hours, so the other side will probably take, you know, have dragging tools out, probably take me an hour and 15 minutes to the other side. We still got some uh, patching to do, you know, up on the tow boards there, but it's in there and it's in there good. It's not coming back out. Floor pans are a good place to practice your uh, welding and bodywork skills. If you can weld rusty floors, you can weld anything. And the nice part about them is nobody ever really sees them, carpet covers them, you get a nice low car, nobody's gonna crawl and you have to check them out. So yeah, you really can't go wrong with just patching the floors yourself. If you can't buy a floor pan, like a, you can for a Tri-5 Chevy, if you got a 49 Kaiser or something like that, and you gotta make your own, just get out the old English stump and a claw hammer and start beating them out. Put them in there, you really can't screw it up. So if you got floor pans that are in the back of your mind that's been bothering you for years, just get out the cutting wheel and get out the welder and get out your hammer and get after it. There's nothing to it, it's pretty easy. Especially when you get floor pans like this where you can buy them. Got them all cleaned up, everything uh, looks pretty good. I didn't uh, get this butted up just perfectly. It's kind of a little bit high, but it's gonna be fine. Throw some paint on it. Some insulation, maybe some carpet. She's gonna be good to go. But I think that's where we're gonna wrap her up tonight here. We're we'll hang out for a while, make sure we don't have any fires in the shop, because you know we like to start fires, but we don't wanna do that. Oh, sh I guess if we burn the shop down, it can't take it from us. So we'll keep an eye on things for a bit and then we'll uh, come back tomorrow and do that side. Maybe finish this up. Yeah, it's gonna be good. I'm excited. I'm not excited about this plastic line on this oil pressure gauge or how this oil pressure gauge is. Look at that, it's got a little swivel built into it. Ooh Oh, and a tattletale on there. What's not pretty neat is all those butt connectors. Oh, dang it. All right, time to have a sandwich. It's another wonderful day in the shop, isn't it, Duff? Doing a little CAD work here. That's cardboard aided drafting. This, this is probably the last Ham's Special Light box in existence. I think this is from like June of 2021. You can tell by the mold on the top that she's been in the uh, beer fridge for a while. Anyway, they don't make ham special light anymore. No more sandwiches. If you think you got them locally, go check. It doesn't say special light right below where it says hams. There's just ham and cheeses. That's all they make, heavies. Anyway, rant over. We interrupt your regular scheduled programming to bring you this Mortsky Minute, brought to you by Duff Beer. Side note, Duffy was not named after Duff Beer. He was actually named after a family the Duffs, who owned a local bar, which no longer own it anymore. But anyway, back to your regularly scheduled Mortsky Minute. This week we're going to talk about the Theo Ham Brewing Company. Hams, the beer refreshing. The Hams Brewing Company is semi-local because it's from St. Paul, Minnesota, just up the road, which was a wild frontier town in 1860. So the Hams Brewing Company actually started as the Excelsior Brewery in 1860 by A.F. Keller. Well, A.F. Keller thought the second gold rush, 1849, 1860, so, you know, 11 years apart, he thought the gold rush was going to happen. And so Theo Ham and him were chums, and Theo funded his trip to go out and stake a claim in California to strike gold, you know, make her rich. But Theo's wife, Louise, said, no, absolutely, you are not going. So he stayed behind, and for the money that Theo gave Mr. Keller, he signed over his flour mill on the river, I presume, in St. Paul, and his brewery, the Excelsior Brewery Company. Well, in 1865, Mr. Keller was no longer with us anymore because he perished in California doing California things, who knows what. So uh, Theo Ham was kind of hooked into the uh, brewing situation, but he owned a saloon of his own, so he knew how to sling drinks. And who did he hire? Jacob Schmidt. No, not John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. The Jacob Schmidt. If Schmidt rings a bell, 
Schmidt and him got into an argument about how they were uh, about Luis. This Luis, she's a she's a character. Uh, R.I.P. Luis, but uh, she got into a little tissy fit with uh, Mr. Schmidt about how he was uh, raising his daughter. I think Marie was her name. But uh, anyway, 1884, Schmidt joined another brewery and then started his own brewery, which became one of the largest breweries in Minnesota. And at one point, Ham's was the largest brewery in Minnesota. Uh, long story short, uh, Mr. Ham got evicted from his, lost his house, lost everything. So he had to move into the brewery when uh, Keller lost everything out in California. And then he grew it from there into uh, a pretty big deal. They ran, the family ran that uh, operation until 1965, so 100 years, and then they sold it out. And then it was owned by Olympia, and it was owned by Paps, and then it was owned by Miller, and then it was, I think it's now owned by Molson Coors. And even in the side note in Wikipedia, where all this information is coming from, Ham Special Light no longer available as of August of 2021. So a year and a half ago, you couldn't get this stuff anymore because of streamlining. So anyway, uh, during the prohibition, because you know most breweries closed, uh, I think at one point this was the fifth largest brewery in the entire nation. So not just Cal or not just California, Minnesota. It's kind of like Eastern California. Uh, it was the largest brewery in Minnesota at one point and I believe the fifth largest brewery in the entire nation at one time and that brewery was open until 1997 under different various names and owners and managers now it's owned by the city and there's doing some revitalization and there's some companies in there and then about half of it is vacant and dilapidated and going back into the earth so that's just a quick short history on what the Theo Ham Brewing Company, and that's where hams come from. Ham and cheese is still available. Ham's heavies. Ham's sandwiches, no longer available. RIP. We got a couple left in the uh, fridge. This week we want to go have a sandwich. But anyway, that is this week's Morsky Minute. Short and sweet. Still well over a minute, you know, because we want to give you that extra punch to uh, have some useless knowledge to carry around with you for the rest of the week. So. Now back to your regularly scheduled craptastic shenanigans about putting floors in a 1956 Chevrolet car. Oh, I love putting floors in. It's the greatest thing ever. If I could just put floors in for the rest of my life, I'd be so happy. I like this stuff because it's, it's really thin and uh, there's always a bunch around the shop. So we took this box, cut her down. I marked where the bend's got to be. And we're gonna try to make a template for this tow board piece. I think we're gonna have to make it in two pieces because this panel curves down here. And I could probably make it out of one using the uh, shrinker stretcher and stuff, but I think we're just gonna try to make it out of two pieces because this piece over here, it'll just be easier that way. I'm not a sheet metal guy, just like Puddin says about himself. So I think we're gonna make it out of two pieces. But we got our template here, we're gonna Transfer this to some 18 gauge. I got a sheet of that around. It's gonna be thicker than this, but it's not obnoxiously thick. And we'll, uh, yeah, mark it out, cut it out, do all the things. Yay, floor fabrication. Duff's favorite thing to do. So as you can see, I just rough cut it out with our four and a half inch angle grinder. And then this is by Kaka or Kaka or something industrial. It's a knockoff of a Beverly Shear. Beverly's were the original, the OGs. I'd love to find one, but they're big money. And you never really find any around here. So we got this knockoff Chinese Taiwanian. But anyway, these things super nice. They leave a nice clean cut. They're quiet, no sparks, no fire, no noise real good and then i just made myself a little uh receiver hitch mount on my table here so i can slide this in and out and it's out of the way when i don't need it and then we got a couple other attachments i want to make a vise to put in there just to hold things not for really cranking on stuff but then we also got our planishing hammer that goes in there as well we can make brackets for whatever we can put a anvil in there or you know we could put a hitch on it we can just tote this thing around that'd be pretty neat all right Let's get this thing uh, trimmed up. 
The other nice thing about using these shears is they don't really leave a mess to clean up. There's no grinding dust everywhere. And they leave a really nice edge, especially if you're doing a bunch of TIG welding. It's pretty much smooth. There's no impurities in there from the cutoff wheel or grinding wheel. So these things are super handy piece of equipment. They don't require a extension cord or a battery, so it's never dead. And uh, the power's out, it'll work. These things are pretty good if you're doing a lot of uh, sheet metal work looking to get yourself one. If somebody's got an old Beverly laying in the corner that they want to part with, I'm glad to take one of these things. It's a legit thing. Part with this one. I think they're just like a number one, a number two, and a number three. One of my sizes. And you can put uh, new jaws in them too if they ever get dinged up. Just a couple of screws here, you can take them out. Those three screws right there. This one I haven't done a lot of cutting with, but they're in pretty good shape. So now we gotta transfer this bend line to this piece of sheet metal, which I think we can do with just taking a measurement. And then we're gonna mark which side is the top so we don't bend it the wrong way. And then we got our little alignment mark there. We're going to transfer that. That way we know where to align it in the car. Alright, let's take a rough measurement of what this lip is. Looks like about 5 eighths of an inch. So, we're just going to transfer that onto here. And this ain't gotta be very exact. Nothing we do is very exact around here. In case you haven't noticed. What is that god awful noise? Nails on a chalkboard, ain't it, Duff? He's like, stop that, please. I know, top and down. That's telling me to bend that down. There you go. Bend down. Ben Dover. I'm Ben. Ben Dover. Uh, yeah. Oh! That is the spot. So now we got a couple options on how to bend this down. Really, you could bend this. We could take this over to the old English stump and just tap and work our way around it. You might have to do a little, I would say, stretching right in here because it's going to want to pull it. But I don't know. We'll see. But I think we're going to try doing it on the old... Uh, bead roller, since how I never ever use that thing. Well, not never ever. I have used it once on the door panels on the Ford Bronco since we moved to the new shop. Other than that, I think it was the same thing. I think we were bending edges, so it might be set up ready to go. Let's do it. Of course, the wrong, it's got some offset dies. We gotta put these tipping dies in our Harbor, Harbor Freight, in our Bailey bead roller. So we're gonna put those in there and then we should be ready to go. bend here just to make sure it's set up in the right direction. It's like coloring, stay inside the lines. There you go, you can see it's starting to get a bend. You gotta put a little pressure on it. I 
There we go, it's got a pretty good start anyway. We don't need a 90 degree bend. That's a pretty good start. Let's go slide her in the car and see how she fits. Looks like we're gonna need a little bit more bend action going on there, which we can't do in that tipping die because it contacts the uh, die. You can see where that bolt was scratching all along there. So that's about, I don't know, 45 degree angle, that's all we can get. We gotta get a little bit more than that. We probably need like a 60 or 65 degrees. So we're just gonna have to use a hammer and dolly or the old English stump to get her bent a little bit further. And then we'll get her fitted in. I don't know what this bracket's for. I think it's just to hold the kick panel, but it's in our way and it's rusty, so it's gonna go away. Everybody always wants some good old English stump action, so here we go. I don't know what this is. It's definitely not oak. Probably, uh, yeah. I don't know my trees. Not a uh, tree eologist, but let's see if we can't uh, work this around a bit. Let's go give her a test fit. Looks like we got her bent a little bit too much, maybe, in there. Or not enough. I can't determine. From about here on over, we got to bend her up just a hair more. So I'm going to go work on that. One more round on the English stone. We got her bent at pretty much at 90 right now. Let's see how that works. Pretty good, I'd say. We gotta bend her out a little bit more. In there. In there. And we're gonna put a little slit right there, so hopefully we can slide this over. Because I guess the way we drew this up, or the way we originally made this, this mark right here is supposed to line up with this, so. We are shifted over quite a ways to the left, but we're still covering everything over here and then more on this side. So that might be why it doesn't fit so great because we're uh, about an inch and a half off. So we're gonna cut a, put a little slit there and hopefully this will slide up that pinch weld here. And then we can put a little, I don't know, whoop de doo roll this end up a little bit so it follows up the transmission tunnel. Then we can actually cut the bottom part off where the pinch weld is. And it should be good or so. I'm gonna do that. And then hopefully we can slide this over and maybe it'll fit a little bit better. We got her opened up a bit. We'll see what happens now. We're probably gonna have to roll that whip up. Some. Use the old English fingers here. Trim a little out that corner again. Fit pretty good over there. Got to bring this down a bit. So I'm gonna beat on that some, and then we'll come back. Like the way this side's mating up over here it's leaving us a gap in the middle so i think what we're going to do is we're just going to cut this end off since we got to remake or since we got to make this piece over here anyway instead of going to here we're just going to move it over to here and that way we can get this gap tighter down here on this pinch weld no big deal don't be afraid to screw up sheet metal isn't cheap but oh well Give it a word. It's not like we gotta throw that away. We can still use that piece to scab in over there or somewhere else, so it's not a complete loss. There. 
yeah, fits a whole lot better now. I really wish we could get a clamp. But there's this brace underneath to right here, so we can't really put a locking pliers on it, and then the inner fender is in the way. And then there's a cross member for the transmission right there, so there's no good way to clamp it. Jed clamp it. Way doggy. I think that's about as good as we're gonna get. So, I think we're just gonna have to seam seal that and uh, weld around the top here. Color good. I wonder if we can't just lean this ahead, weld along this seam, and then bend it back into the floor. That might work. Because, yeah, when we bend it back, that gap opens way up. And I'm sure if I knew what I was doing with that bead roller, we could probably get that bent just perfect. But we don't know what we're doing. There, we get a nice tight gap. And she's just about snug up to the floorboard. Put a couple of self tappers in there and that'll hold it so we can weld it. Problem solved. You can use Clecos for this too. That's probably what the professionals do. But if you don't know what Clecos are, I guess we'll have to show you one of these days. I believe we used them in the square body rust repair video. That panel's hot. We just gotta burn that in. I don't know if I'm gonna, I might weld this whole seam instead of seam sealing it just because it's gonna be easy to weld and there's an angle on each side so it's not really gonna warp and it's nice new metal so I can probably just zap her all the way down if I get my torch set right. And then we'll be on the home stretch up here. We just got this guy to do and this guy. Tip of the day, don't get weld in your Phillips head screw so that you can't get a Phillips bit in there. And you gotta take it out with the locking pliers. First time I've ever had that happen. I'm not gonna be able to reuse that guy. Casualty of war. We got our professional floorboard inspector just hanging out down here. Keeping an eye on things, aren't you, Duff? What a silly dog. All right, let's do some more weld and get this one finished up. Such a good bead rolling supervisor, just sitting at the top of the steps, making sure I bent it the right way. You're a good pupper, Duff. Duff, are we boring you to death with floors? Flooring you to death? This thing was a pain to make. A little help from our sugar stretcher from Bailey. Took a little metal shaping class with those guys a few years ago, so that's how I ended up with all their equipment. The old man and I went and took a course. But uh, 
I use that shrinker stretcher on this lip down here to, it's kind of got a, I don't know, double convex contour to it. So we got her fitted to the floor pan here and then tight up against our kick panel. Got a couple of tech screws, we're gonna call them, you know, we're fancy, but they're really just self tappers. Suck her down to the floor. And then we got her butted up against our other panel here. Should uh, clean up pretty good. Use a little seam sealer on this side. Yeah, I probably could have drilled a couple holes over here. Spot weld. Maybe I'll do that. We'll see. But she's in there pretty good. Let's burn her in. Made me a little patch for the transmission tunnel. Bent her over the uh, English knee. I'm gonna trim her out. Buzz her in. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. together so now we just got to do uh, the other front corner and the backs so. yay yay now we're gonna do the exact same thing over here on the passenger side only different because we're gonna learn from our mistakes and we're gonna not cut a gaping hole in the transmission tunnel yeah it's gonna just go swimmingly Duff's hiding behind the welder because he knows it's not gonna we're gonna give her the old college try though here we go. Well, you came to check it out. How's it look? Yeah, not good. I thought that tow board was gonna be savable, but she's she's pretty pitted. She's pretty soft, ain't she, Duff? All right, we gotta finish this lip over here by Duff's uh, left ear, and then start doing a little fitting. And we're uh, cutting and button, and then we gotta make a tow board. And we gotta clean out that uh, front cab support and put a little primer in that. And man, you are a shedding monster, Duff. Look what you did to my floorboards. You just destroyed them. All right, back to work. Duff, I got a grind and stuff in there. And you don't wanna get lit on fire. I've been lighting myself on fire for years. It's no fun.
All right, we got this floor pan burned in about as far as we can go. We gotta do some rust repair here. This transmission tunnel is paper thin, so we gotta remake that. This tow board has gotta be redone. So I guess we'll uh, keep on keeping on and cutting rust out. Yay. I don't know what happened here, but something must have ran on the firewall, windshield leaked or something, and this whole tow board is, is pretty cheesy. There's a bead here, and then a vertical one here, and a stamping there, and then a horizontal bead here, and I don't know, it's, it's got some beads in it. The ones I found online are like 150 bucks, you know, they're a week out, and they don't fit that well. I did one in a 55 Chevy wagon once and was not impressed, so we're going to make our own. So I made a template, you know, it's probably going to be several pieces. I'm going to do the corner over here like we did on that side, and then a main piece, and then we're going to have to transition into the tunnel. And there's a, a rib here that comes down. It's There's a lot of contours. Not a sheet metal guy. So I'll show you what I got going on. So here's what I got. I got a little bend for the transmission tunnel. We're going to put a couple beads in there. We're going to follow the straight lines. Honey, old Bailey here. I don't know what size bead that is. Five eighths, something like that. Maybe half inch. I'm gonna put this in there, run her back and forth a couple times. And I think we're gonna call it good. We'll see how bad it warps. You're supposed to uh, pre-stretch these, but I don't have a pre-stretcher, AKA a uh, English wheel. So if you got one, you wanna send it to us, that'd be great. But until then, we're just winging it. First thing, just gonna slide her in there. Get her to go about where we want to start. And then we crank this down. And the key is to crank it down the same amount for each bead. That way, each bead is the same depth. Capiche? Capiche! Capiche! You trying to say capiche? Yeah. Well, don't do it because it hurts my ears when you do it. All right, gentlemen, start your engines. One down, two to go. Uh, didn't bend a whole lot. Not a little bit. Nothing we can't fix in the old English knee. But this thing's going to be a lot more rigid with those in there. I know it doesn't seem like it now, but nobody's here. It's just me flexing sheet metal. It got rid of that whole wibbly wobbly noise that uh, sheet metal makes when you flop around. You want to show them another tech tip, Duff? Get yourself one of these, what the hell are these hollow punch thingers called? Uh, a hollow punch set. Sure enough, hollow punch. It's for like leather stuff. We take this and you cut half of it off. Let me show you what one looks like before we molest them. Like that, you cut half of it off and then you take and you put it at the end of your bead here. This is a half inch one because it's a half inch bead. And you smack it down there so it gives it a nice, round, abrupt end to your bead roll. No extra charge for that tip. Just the tips. I think that's what we'll call that section. Just the tips. Look at how nice. See, it's just kind of a slow, dull end, boring. You take that. Bada bing, a bada boom. Mucho Batero. There we go. We just gotta get it fit back in the car somehow. All right, guys, I think that's where we're gonna wrap it up this week on the 1956 Chevrolet two door post we picked up from our pal Eli over at Rigid Customs. I got some plans for this thing, nothing too crazy. We're gonna keep fixing the floors. We're gonna adjust the ride height a little bit. You know, maybe spruce up these wheels, make it run a little bit better. You know, there's a 
noise coming from the front end we might try to resolve the shift linkage is a little slow. we got a whole list of things we're going to do but we got to get these floors patched up and so i want to do that right so i'm going to get a break and we're going to bend the floors all semi-professional ish and we're going to get that patched up and we'll probably uh, paint them and seam seal them and all that good stuff and maybe even you know, put some carpet in there who knows so let me know what you want to see done with this thing. Should we uh, LS swap it, put a small block in it, maybe a blown big block and a straight axle? Just kidding, none of that's going to happen. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Check out our other videos. Check out the merch. Link down below. we got super scrapers in stock if you need some of those. Hit us up with an email, mortskirepair at gmail.com. This car probably will be available once we get a little bit further along. Like I said, i got some parts sitting on the shelf that I want to incorporate into this thing once we get them all incorporated and have our fun with it then uh, we'll make it available to you the general public so remember it doesn't matter how you get it done so long as you're having fun and let me tell you what floors put the f u in fun all right i guess we'll uh see you next week and maybe we'll work on something else maybe we'll finish that tow board maybe we'll lose the shot who knows on to the next one The Jumbo Fuzzy Dive. Fuzzy d Ow. Probably some really good footage of the back of my elbow, huh?